everyone. Welcome to Garden Fork Radio. You're here with Rick and Eric. Good morning, Eric. How are you, my friend? I'm good. Uh, we have dug out of yet another snowstorm, so we're fine here. Okay, excellent. So you must be in uh, in Brooklyn today. I'm in New York. Uh, the biggest battle here is fighting the ice on the sidewalk because it gets warm enough in the day that the snow starts to melt and then it freezes at the end of the day and you get that black ice kind of thing on your sidewalk. Oh, um, yeah, that's dangerous. Yeah, and then you know you just don't want your neighbors to slip, you know. But then you, uh, I don't want to put out too much salt because it, I don't think it's good for the world, and it's not good for my dog's feet. So yeah. By the way, uh, how are things up in Connecticut? They're great. Our power did not go out, so um, I do have the generator all hooked up and gassed up. I have gas stabilizer in the tank. So uh, one of my best friends that lives up there, and if need be, he will go turn it on. That, that is a good friend. They'll get out in that kind of weather to go do something for you. Yeah, yeah. It's the test of friendship phone call, I call it. it. <laughs> <laughs> I figure when, when the power goes out up there, my, one of my neighbors will call me, and I have about 36 to 48 hours to get some heat into the house, because um, I keep the house at 45. Yeah. And then well, I figure I have uh, a day, a day and a half before it'll start to freeze the pipes, so... Right. Well, I heard your uh, solo show last week, and you done good, my friend. Thank you. Um, I, I have to. Um, I can only talk for so long solo, so they're a little shorter. <laughs> well, you know, and, and uh, the only thing I'd have to add, you know, you were talking about how it was good that they actually shut down the roads and kind of closed things down. That's not a bad thing. I, you know, as a uh, uh, decades and decades and decades ago, I used to be a cop and. I always think about the um, the emergency workers in a in a situation like that. If you're not on the roads, uh, you're not stuck in a uh, a snowbank. If you're not stuck in a snowbank, uh, the state police and the record drivers and the rescue crews and the uh, people aren't going to have to come out and find you. And so uh, it's it's best all the way around if you uh, you know if they just go ahead and close things down. I think it was totally fine. Um, there's always this. Uh political impact i guess and the second guessing afterward but yeah we all drive suvs but you still need to know how to drive and sometimes just common sense says you know uh, i'm just gonna stay home <laughs> oh yeah well and people um overestimate their uh skills or or the uh, the abilities of their suvs and their four-wheel drives most of the time anyway i have seen some spectacular accidents because people uh, you know, the laws of physics are not suspended just because you're driving an SUV. My other uh, suggestion for everyone is uh, I always drive with my headlights on no matter what. But if it's if it's raining out, mm -hmm. if you're using your windshield wipers, you should have your headlights on. You bet. And I think a lot of cars, the dashboard lights come on when that senses a little darkness in the cab of the car. Um but for maybe sometimes the headlights aren't automatically turning on as some cars you have to manually do it. So they think their lights are on because the dashboard lights are on. And I've seen cars going down the highway at night with no headlights. And I'm like, what, what are you doing? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah we, uh, we drive with our headlights on all the time. Yeah. I, I think it definitely helps. Uh, so there on, you go. Yeah. On, and one of, yeah. on one of the cars, the matrix, I think, uh, yeah, you know, it's impossible to turn them off. Um, they, it's that model that, uh, one year I think they had, uh, automatic lights that just come on regardless and uh they're daylight running lights and then they switch the headlights and so uh, th there's no way without uh rewiring the car that uh, that uh, something's not on i wonder if all new cars have that or not i wonder if uh maybe scientist tony could uh, enlighten us on that perhaps i know he just got a new car by the way big hint tony yeah, Tony, we need to talk to you. And he's changing jobs, so uh, I guess he's pretty busy right now. Cool. So, Hey, I'm, started, I'm still transitioning uh, the Garden Fork YouTube channels. Uh, Garden Fork, the main channel, is going to be our cooking channel. And DIY Garden Fork is going to be our second YouTube channel. So if you would subscribe to that channel, that would be really uh, helpful. It helps in our search ranking on YouTube and Google. But I'm re-editing a bunch of old videos and putting them up on the new channel. And I'm doing the seed starting and cold frame videos right now. Okay. And I just did the first cold frame one, which I took a uh, old storm window and made a plywood box for it and um, built a really kind of quick and dirty, but s holds up really well cold frame. 
And it just reminded me that about now is when you, if you're living in uh, the Northeast at least, is when you can start some seedlings, salad seedlings indoors under your garden fork grow lights. Right. And uh, yeah, it's uh, last uh, about Christmas or so we were talking about, maybe around the new year. Uh, the seed catalogs have just started coming in, and I'm starting to get excited about that. And, uh, yeah, right about now is the time uh, to uh, get those seedlings going so you can get uh, the first uh, crops out. Also, I, I just, I'm a big advocate of the grow lights. I just don't think most seedlings, vegetable seedlings, do not do well in a window unless you have some amazing sunlight. Yeah. Um, they get kind of long and leggy, and they flop over on themselves. Just doesn't work, I don't think. Well, and then, you know, the, the roots, the uh, not the roots, but the, the stems right at the soil become really thin where it folds over and lots of times they have problems there. So, yeah, uh, grow lights are a great idea. You did a terrific video. Uh, you published it, what, just yesterday, I think. On I re- it's one of the ones I re-edited. Yep. Mm-hmm. And by the way, I was at the uh, Costco and they had LED shop lights, you know, because you can get the four foot fluorescent shop lights, which is the basis of our grow light rig. Right. Um, and they had LED ones and they were not cheap, but um, they weren't plugged in. So I was kind of curious to see just how bright they were. But the LED lights will last a heck of a lot longer. My big issue with the cheap shop lights is the fluorescent bulbs are always burning out. Um, yeah. But they're not. So their upfront cost is going to be higher, but your long term costs are going to be lower and they're going to cost less to run also because it's an LED instead of a fluorescent. So right, that might be in my future. Might be. Uh, did they say anything about what the uh, spectrum was on those lights? No, it's Costco, you know? Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. at the end of the aisle where one they weren't handing out food for once. You know, they had fluorescent lights instead of somebody handing out food. So, You know, I saw a um, – I, I have seen videos of um, indoor grow situations where the they use LEDs, and they, they make them in the grow industry just for uh, growing. And um, – they're they're deep red and they're bright blue and there's no white light in there at all interesting the gas stations i go to you know they have the canopy over the gas pumps and they're replacing their light fixtures with these led arrays and they are bright Mm -hmm. now i don't know how many leds are in there or what kind of voltage but it's and it's a white a, a very cold white white light so right but i was just like wow we had some um, ceiling lights. We had I had to replace one, and um, I went ahead and replaced uh, it and its neighbor, so they would be balanced with uh, LEDs, just because they were so hard to get to. Um, I didn't want to be getting up there too often. Yeah, they have. Um, I call them can lights. They're the or top hat lights. They're lights that are up in the ceiling. The little recessed lights. They're mm-hmm. circular. Right. Um, there are a number of companies that have a retrofit kit that will. You know, they have what's called an Edison base, the screw in Edison base in there. And it will have a LED fixture that pops in there. And you basically, to plug it in, you screw it into the Edison base and then you pop this round circular LED into it and it sits flush. So you retrofitted um, any kind of can light into an LED and it's a dimmable LED. So it gives right. um, the last forever and your lower lower uh, electrical costs. I love it. Yeah, and like I say, if uh, if they're way up there, um, it's sure to uh, have LEDs where you can just uh, change them once and then maybe never again, or at least not for many years. <laughs> I like that. So I went to um, the grocery store, and the yogurt that I usually buy, they were out of, and I grabbed what I thought was plain low-fat yogurt of another brand, and I got home, and I the, the Labradors get yogurt every day. Um, I also give them ground up flaxseed and uh, olive oil. They they eat well, so that they must, yeah. And I, I always kind of take a scoop for myself. You know, I also have yogurt as well. And I realized I had bought um, French vanilla yogurt instead of plain yogurt. Mm-hmm. And I was struck by how sweet it was. And I'm like, wow. So I looked at the label, and one cup of this French vanilla yogurt has 33 grams of sugar in it. Wow. I was like, wow, <laughs> that's a, that's, is that two teaspoons you think? Uh, I'd had to get out the calculator and find out. Uh, but yeah, that's, that's a lot. Well, let me that's, use that, the no, supercomputer here. Te- 33 grams. One gram of sugar in uh, tablespoons. Let's see. Da, da, da. How many grams of sugar in a teaspoon? Why don't they, they always have a truncated answer. 
Okay, one tablespoon of sugar is 48 calories and 12 grams of sugar. Wow. Yeah, yeah. So I was a little stunned by that. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, the, of course, the low fat, one of the things that they, they're discovering is that they have to fill with something. And so they're, it's not sugar in there they're replacing with, but they're replacing with carbohydrates. And so you're kind of, you know, switching one kind of carbohydrate for another kind of carbohydrate uh, when you eat the low fat. Yeah, and they, um, I'm looking at an NPR article here right now, sorry. <laughs> the average American is consuming 22 teaspoons of sugar a day. That's about three times what's recommended. Huh? Yeah, no kidding. Of course, most of it comes out of, uh, I'll bet, soda waters. Yeah, I just don't drink soda. I mean, thankfully, mm -hmm. I don't do that. But um, Yeah, I've even given up the, uh, the diet soda the, uh, for the most part. Every now and then I'll have one. Good for you. I, I drink it for the uh, the caffeine more than anything in the the fizz, not. Uh, but anyway, yeah, maybe we'll get that. you one of those uh, carbonators, those desk, those countertop carbonators. Yeah, <laughs> that's that's what I need, a seltzer, uh, seltzer bottle. Yeah. So yeah. moving away from uh, sugar, we'll talk to another danger. Uh, <laughs> What's there, that? Well, there was uh, uh, unfortunately a deadly uh, train car crash. Um, just north of here two days ago. Oh, I uh, saw that. Yeah, commuter commuter train, Metro North commuter train. And there was a, a person in a car, and they were stuck between the gates that came down. You know, the, the, at the, it's called a at-grade crossing. Right. Um, the gates came down, and the woman was on the tracks, and she actually got out of the car and tried to raise the gate back up um, to get out off the tracks and then she got back into the car and then the train came and hit her unfortunately mm. so there's a number of articles in the new york times about this and they were talking with a uh a train safety expert and he said if the tra if the guards come down and you're stuck between the guards just floor it oh yeah <laughs> drive through the guard the guards are just the they're i don't know if they're wood but they're designed to break their breakaway Mm -hmm. um, you're going to scratch up your car, but you're going to be alive. Oh, yeah. Uh, having a train hit your car scratches it up pretty good, too. Yeah. And so, you know, if you're, first of all, don't try and drive around the guards. If, they, if they've come down, you're going to sneak past because trains go really fast um, and it takes them forever to stop. But if the guards come down and you're, and you're in between them, just drive through it. And then, you know, if the train didn't come or, oh, you could call, you know, the local police and say, look, the guards came down and I broke it, you know. Mm -hmm. Of course, the other thing is to kind of pay attention. And, and I see a lot of people that will get stuck on the tracks because of, of stop and go traffic. Yes. And it's like getting stuck in the middle of an intersection. Well, the, the secret to not getting stuck in the middle of the intersection is don't get out there until there's room on the other side for you to drive through the intersection and and uh, be on that other side safely through the intersection. Same thing applies to uh, railroad crossings. Do not sit on the tracks. Yeah, well, actually, in the next town to us, there is a railroad crossing. And it's actually a lot of, most people are pretty smart about it. They wait, you know, there's a traffic light about 30 feet after the railroad tracks, and people will wait um, on either side of that track. So Right. Yeah, I remember um, years and years ago uh, when I was a young troop, uh, I was stationed up in uh, Misawa, Japan, way, way far north, almost uh, as far north as you can get on the main island of Honshu. And they have the bullet train, and it actually goes under the um, the water to the next island over. And that uh, the train at that time was about a 200-mile-an-hour train, and the Japanese had a rail crossings there with a little sign of a choo-choo, and no cross bucks at all, no, no uh, rail things coming down and every now and then um, uh, some of our troops get hit on that thing and uh, you know you'd have to look for uh, wallets to try to figure out who's in the car because that, that's about all that was left wow yeah note to self <laughs> yeah you take those uh, those rail crossings seriously in japan yeah drive just break the thing off yeah you're gonna scratch your car up but you'll be alive so yeah there you go a little some car car and winter safety stuff there 
Hey everyone, just the quick shameless plug part of the Garden Fork Radio Show. If you do any shopping on Amazon.com or Home Depot.com, there are links in the show notes of this podcast. And if you click on that, that'll take you to Home Depot or Amazon and it'll tell them that you came from Garden Fork. And we get a little finder's fee for that. So anything you buy on Amazon or Home Depot in that next 24 hours, we get a little finder's fee for it. And they're like, hey, thanks for sending your listeners to our site. HomeDepot.com is cool because you can order things and then have them picked up at the store, save some shipping. Also, if you're not home during the day, it's essentially being shipped to their store and you go get it when you want. And Amazon, well, Amazon is what it is. Uh, it's everything. Huh? All right, here we go. We have a really nice uh, viewer mail from South Africa. It says, hi, Eric and everybody. I thought I'd let you know that because of your lentils and carrots video, for the first time in my life, I took a leap of faith and thought, ha, if Eric can cook lentils and make it look so easy, so can I. They were the best. And my beagles thought so too. <laughs> Thanks, guys. I would not feed dogs lentils, okay? <laughs> Why not? Uh, they're just very high in fiber. Oh, well, yeah, but, you know, some dogs need it. Uh, my little Sydney, I have to feed her... Uh, uh, the, carrots, uh, not raw carrots, but, uh, or I'm sorry, pumpkin. That's what I'm trying to think of out of the can to uh, help keep things moving on as she gets a little bit older, things slow down and, um, so okay. it, it helps her. So right. she needs that. Okay. Thank you. We're talking about dogs. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Yeah. Lentils are super easy and they, they actually taste even better the next day. Like most foods. And the lentil and carrot recipe I have, which I think came from, the idea came from Martha Rose Shulman of the New York Times, who writes on their well blog and also for the food section. And it's literally, um, uh, I think it's a tablespoon of coriander seeds, not ground coriander, with some onion uh, and a couple other things, carrots, of course. Mm -hmm. And you just let that cook down. Lentils... Um, depending on which lentils you use, they take longer or shorter times to cook. The brown, the generic brown lentils that you get in the store, I would suggest not using for this. You want to get either the French green lentils or Goya sounds sells one called the Panaderia. I think they're called Pana, Panaderia, Pandaria le brown lentils, and they hold their shape. Mm -hmm. And it's it's delicious. You can make a big batch and you can have it over a couple nights. It's really good with mustard or a little balsamic vinegar or apple cider vinegar on it. You might want to say why you don't use the brown lentils. They fall apart. They turn no. to mush. They turn to the mush. That's, and, I think but, that's a lot of problem people have with lentils is they cook the kind of generic brown lentils. And I think they're fine mushy, but I think a lot of people are like, oh, you know, and they have kind of a granularity to them. Right. Uh, if you spend a couple extra cents and get the nicer ones, also consider going to a Indian or Pakistani market, um, even like a world foods kind of place. And they will have all sorts of different kind of lentils. And that's a lot of fun to play with. Yeah. Or you can go down to the uh, whole foods place. They always have them. Yes. Yes, they do too. Um, they're a little more pricey, but they are usually, um, they have a lot of organic kind of stuff there. So yeah. And, and Trader Joe's, we get them there. Yeah. But yeah, I like, I like them, but boy, you have to spice them because they're pretty bland. I, what I think is they have a warmth and a, they give a fullness to you and they're super healthy. Um, mm -hmm. I think they're a minor protein. They're not a full protein. Um, and they go really well with onions uh, or sausages. Sausage and lentils is kind of a classic, I think. Right. Um, we do brown rice and lentils. Wow. That's, and of that's, course, brown rice and lentils make a, a complete protein. There you go. Wow. We're talking deep dietitian stuff here. That's it. Speaking of um, proteins, and you know, we talked a little bit about uh, getting things started. Heard a great podcast on NPR the other day. It was on a series called The Salt. It's uh, yes. Uh, talks about food and, and whatnot, and we've probably have been villainizing farmers for over fertilizing. Uh, and the water running off into the rivers and whatnot, and then nitrates uh, building up. In the water, nitrates. In the water. water, in the water, I'm sorry, yes, in the water and whatnot, without really thinking 
about what the real problem is. And this podcast, and we'll link to it in the show notes. I'll, uh, if you don't have that link, I'll be sure and send it to you, is um, talking about that. And the real problem is not over-fertilizing. It's that farmers do not grow cover crops during the off months, which in, in particularly in the um, in the Midwest and, and the northern tier is uh, about three quarters of the year. And so there is no plant there living to absorb the nitrogen. And most of the runoff is coming from the uh, the roots and the stems, the stalks and whatnot decaying and then dissolving back into the um, into the soil. Hmm. And so the real point, uh, what people need to think about doing, what farmers are beginning to do more and more now, and we need to encourage them to do this, and what we need to do in our own yards and our own gardens is grow a cover crop. Winter rye, there are any number of things you can put in there that will not spread, that will provide, um, you know, soak up all this nitrogen, hold it in suspension until uh, – the spring comes, it'll die off, and then you uh, turn it under and plant on top of it, and then that nitrogen nitrogen gets recycled into your plants, hmm. and it does not run away. I wonder how that folds into um, or how that compares or contrasts with the no-till uh, farming methods. Oh, probably pretty well. Um, if you use the right cover crops and time things properly – Probably the no-till, uh, the the winter rye will die out about the time that uh, uh, the uh, – and then you can just kind of leave it standing or maybe mow it down a little bit and then plant through it. Interesting. Huh. And while we're on the subject of the podcast, I heard another one. Everyone uh-huh. now has these little quadcopters and drones and stuff, and they're flying around and taking pictures, and they're really big – on um, taking pictures of uh, in the birding community and people go because you know you fly up to a bird or a bird nest you look inside and see what's going on and they have done some studies and it turns out that to a certain extent birds are not bothered by these copters uh-huh. uh, and you can get within about 15 feet of a nest and most of the time it will not disturb the birds with one exception anything that comes in from above they take to be a hawk or a, a falcon or something or a bird of prey and a threat, and that will alarm the birds and shoo them off the nest. And so uh, they have done this study. I heard it on a Scientific American um, podcast the other day, and uh, it's really okay to use quadcopters to fly up. And, and um, biologists are using them to go up and look in trees, look over the edge, and, and see um, how the nestlings are doing in different uh, varieties and species without actually having to climb the trees. Interesting. I um, I think they're amazing machines. I think um, I'll, I'll, I, maybe we just hear about the bad incidents, but it seems like just common sense is in short supply sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, hey, I'm going to fly this thing, and I'm right near the White House. <laughs> yeah, that, well, you know, that guy was a little, um, a little three sheets to the wind, I think, when he did that. Yeah, but yeah. Uh, maybe you have to go have a breathalyzer test before you can fly a quad. You know, yeah, and he, and he actually confessed up, and everything worked out okay. Yeah, at least he, you know. But I have, you know, I've had a couple. Uh, I want to call them incidents with quads, but um, it's just like you. I don't know. <laughs> there yeah. are some amazing things because there is a an article in the Times today about it where uh, in Europe, I think it's in Denmark, they are testing the idea of um, a quadcopter being like a emergency ambulance that has a defibrillator on it and it lands. You know that you can call nine one one and then the defibrillator, a quadcopter is dispatched with a defibrillator and it will, can get there before the ambulance, uh, the paramedics get there. Wow. Isn't interesting. that interesting? <laughs> yeah. What if it, what if it just made a mistake and it's chasing you around, trying to you know, rubbing those paddles, trying to zap you? <laughs> <laughs> oh. But you know, those things that you see them everywhere here now. Those defibrillators. Um, a woman my wife worked with at the uh, naval hospital uh, was playing tennis and collapsed, and there was a defibrillator on the. Um, tennis court and uh two doctors there were able to uh revive her 
uh, using the uh, defibrillators, and she would have died otherwise. That's a beautiful thing. That's cool. Mm-hmm. Let's see. Oh, I wanted to talk about, you know, you and I are both big fans of Evernote. Yes. I think I'm sitting here, uh, have, I have uh, have been working on my Evernote, trying to rectify and get rid of duplicates and whatnot. And uh, I think I have about 3,000 notes in it right now. And you kind of forget what's in there sometimes. Mm-hmm. And there is a little add-on now for Evernote called Reflect, R-E-F-L-E-C-T. Mm-hmm. It's free. And you can set it up to help you review uh, Evernote um, cards. I call them cards, um, pages. And so for every card, you can say, um, uh, just run 10 by me a day. And, and you can see what they are. Now, you, if you're a student or something, you can set up uh, each notebook. So it just looks at one notebook and will flash these cards at you so many times a day. Uh, so you can review them. But it kind of keeps them and you know, gives you a chance to look at them and go, oh, yeah, I remember I still have that or, or that kind of thing. You know, it, but it, if you're a student, it helps to uh, drill you on things. Yeah, that's my biggest issue with um... – well, I, like, I, I clean my desk and I have a stack of like recipes I want to look at. And the stack is two inches high. And I'm like, I, at, at some point, I'll probably just put them all in the recycle, you know? Mm-hmm. <laughs> so this, it could bring, it could refresh my memory about them. Go, oh, yeah, I want to do that one. Yeah. It kind of, yeah, and it serves, uh, yeah, even if you're just, uh, if you keep one, uh, yeah, I keep a notebook called Ideas mm-hmm. and, um, or quotations. Uh, I, I save a lot of quotations. And, uh, you just kind of it flips through uh, twice a day. It'll flip through uh, one notebook or the other for me, and you go, "Oh yeah, I need to think about that, or maybe I should do something with it, or uh, isn't that stupid? You know, who thought of that? You know? <laughs> <laughs> I said, "Oh, you did, dummy." <laughs> All right. Well, on that note, <laughs> um. Everyone, if you would help us, you could write a review of our iTunes podcast here on iTunes itself. Podcasts have become the new cupcake, so everyone start, has starting up a podcast now. That's right. And, uh, competition is good, but the attention is good too. All of a sudden, everybody's listening to them. Yeah, but we're falling off the uh, we're falling off the uh, the search of I- on the iTunes thing. So if you oh, no. check that out. And we are now um, updating the iTunes, the Garden Fork video show on iTunes is now getting new videos uh, once I finally figured that out once again. Um, So if you want to go check that out, you can. And the best way to find out about everything Garden Fork is our email newsletter. If you just go to gardenfork.tv right on the front page, uh, you can sign up for our email newsletter. That's gardenfork.tv. And it sends you uh, links to all the latest of uh, your newsletters. And you've had a lot lately. Yeah, I'm re-editing a lot of the old shows and reposting them and updating with new information. And there's a bunch of shows that videos that people haven't seen because they're they're six years old or something. Right. And there's only there's 350 videos I think out there. So I'm slowly going through them. <laughs> well, but uh, you know, most recently I see uh, oatmeal and no need bread. Five no need uh, bread tips. Yeah, I didn't. We would talk. We've been talking about no need bread on each Garden Fork radio, so I thought we'd we'd talk about that next time. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, cheap grow lights and grow light stands. Uh, we did polenta. We talked about that a couple of weeks ago. I love polenta. That's like that's my my new thing. Yeah, coconut banana bread, dishwasher removal, plywood boats. We're talking about the uh, the great mighty Garden Fork uh, arsenal of uh, boats that are. Or the Mata out flotilla. there floating around the flotilla. That's it. Yeah, I'm gonna build. I'm gonna build a, a plywood canoe. I'm pretty sure. Mm. Lento carrots and coriander. Coriander. Yeah, that's what we just talked about with uh, Jill and the beagles in South Africa. Yeah, winter feeding of bees, pressure cooker short ribs. Yeah, it's all there. It's all on the site and uh, on our YouTube uh, channels. Um, some of it is on the iTunes thing. I haven't been putting the the older videos. I haven't been uploading to. Uh, iTunes because there's a it basically I have to pay for all the bandwidth um, ah. so and we're actually going to be offering soon a way to help uh, to help you pay for that bandwidth <laughs> <laughs> okay <laughs> we'll have a little campaign for that so all right 
So thank you for listening. Once again, it's always great to hear from you guys. Uh, it is radio at gardenfork.tv. Radio at gardenfork.tv is the best way to get a hold of us. Um, and if I haven't written back to you, it's because I, I something got lost. And so just re-email me and go, hey, I didn't hear from you. Yeah, don't worry about bothering us. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, my friend. Well, listen, uh, I got to get on down the road here. I've got uh, dog stuff to do. Yeah, you got to feed your dog carrots or pumpkin or whatever. <laughs> pumpkin, yeah, pumpkin <laughs> and uh, get them walked. And uh, it's been rainy and cloudy, but it looks like it's uh, going to give me a chance to get outside a little bit. All right. Thanks, everyone. We'll see you later. Thanks, everyone, for listening. Appreciate that. Again, if you are shopping on Amazon.com or Home Depot.com, there are links in the show notes here. There are also links on any page of the gardenfork.tv website as well. Appreciate that. Helps us pay the bills, helps us put out all the stuff we do. All right, see ya. Garden Fork's theme music is used under license from uniquetracks.com.